Civil Defense Administration presents the role of the warden in rescue. Cause, a bomb burst. Result, in this fringe area, fire and destruction, surface and trapped casualty. All the conditions of disaster, a horrified population, blocked streets, the city's firefighting facilities swamped with calls. Heavily trapped casualties in multi-story buildings. Effecting their rescue without endangering lives will take the professional skills of the organized rescue service. But in this interim period, before the arrival of the rescue service with its power equipment and advanced rescue techniques, what about other types of disaster casualties? This surface casualty in need of immediate removal to shelter and medical aid. This woman, lightly trapped in a burning home, under the pressure of fear, taking refuge in closets, beds, or under furniture. This casualty, trapped by a floor section, would require the services of a trained rescue team. Thorough training of neighborhood personnel in elementary rescue techniques is the major job of the rescue warden, so that if and when disaster strikes, through swift and efficient action, lives can be saved. The organized rescue service is now on the scene to perform more technical operations. The block rescue warden and his group will provide assistance as needed, acting under the direction of the rescue service. Meet Bill Collins, block rescue warden, a member of the block warden's unit. Bill Collins knows the value of pre-attack training for residents of the block. He also knows just how far elementary rescue operations extend, only to service and lightly trapped casualties. Now for a training review. Let's take up again the causes of collapsed buildings where casualties may be trapped. Blast, fire, earth shock. Joe Dawson, how about a multi-story steel building? Well, that kind of a building has a steel frame with reinforced concrete. The walls may be blown out or sucked in. Right, Joe. That's where you'll find most of your heavily trapped casualties. How about private homes, Mrs. March? Well, the suction wave of the blast may push the walls outward. The debris will fall on the streets. The roof, floors, and some of the inside walls will then lose their support and collapse. That might form various kinds of voids where casualties may be located. The trained rescue warden will be able to determine those who are likely trapped and those which require removal by a trained rescue team. Right. That goes for most of the buildings in our block. In fact, most structures throughout the country. Next, the block rescue group reviews the different types of voids formed by collapsed buildings. These are some of the ways that walls and floors of a building may collapse. Pete, how about entering a burning home to effect a rescue? Keep close to the walls and stairways. Where there's heavy smoke, stay close to the floor with a wet handkerchief or towel over your nose and mouth. To prevent floods of this nature, the rescue group should plug all breaks in line. How about electricity breakdowns, Mrs. Higgins? Well, I know one thing for sure. Don't ever tamper with live wires that are down. Not unless you want to fry. There's no such thing as a tame wire, whether it looks dangerous or not. That's telling you, Mrs. Higgins. And don't forget to shut off the current supply of any damaged buildings by opening the master switch, usually near the meter or the fuse box. All right, Mr. Lewis, now we come to broken sewers and dangerous gases. Sewer gas can knock you out or blow you to kingdom come. Don't use open flames around broken sewers and don't go into any area contaminated with sewer gas. Check. Setting off large gas valves isn't the job of the engineering or organized rescue service. But if you come in a building where gas is escaping, 
Try to turn off the shutoff valve near the basement meter. How are you going to rescue some of these people without special equipment? Glad you brought that up, Joe. As you know, it's my job as rescue warden to see to it that our own rescue equipment at block headquarters is always ready for use. Now, this isn't technical equipment, but with some imagination, we can improvise special tools when necessary out of everyday household equipment. The rescue warden and members of his group now review methods of putting to use dozens of household articles for special purposes in rescue operations. For example, a bed sheet takes the place of a rope, a meat cleaver becomes a hatchet, a blanket, a stretcher. Methods suitable for two rescuers, the two-handed and four-handed seat carriers, also carrying by the extremities. Many training sessions are devoted to methods of building and using emergency stretchers in elementary rescue operations. The rescue warden and members of his group thoroughly explore the various techniques involved in the use of stretchers, lifting the casualty onto the stretcher, covering with blankets, then carrying the stretcher. The importance and proper use of ladders form another major training area. Various types of ladder carries are demonstrated with each member of the rescue group taking part. Conducting these intensive training exercises is the rescue warden's responsibility, but he has other duties as well. Developing a block census that includes every family member on the block with special attention given to physically handicapped. Information that will be of great value in time of disaster. The rescue warden must also know the location of shelters and of places where people are likely to be trapped. In addition, the rescue warden should know the location of every utility shutoff valve, every switch on the block, in order to ensure swift and effective action in an emergency. Armed with these tools, Thorough pre-attack training and information about every person, every building and utility on the block, the rescue warden and members of his group are now prepared to fulfill their responsibility when disaster strikes, the rescue of surface and lightly trapped casualties. First, the rescue warden makes a reconnaissance of the disaster area. If the help of the rescue service is needed, the block warden must be notified at once. In this precious interim period, with inhabitants of the block missing, members of the rescue group make an immediate search. Members of this group must be trained to recognize the hazard existing in damaged buildings and the care required on entering from fallen rubble and debris. After the search is completed, the main entrance of the building should be properly marked to indicate a search has been made. Presence of dangerous conditions should also be prominently marked. Elsewhere, a lone rescuer puts to use training in the removal of casualties. By means of the human crutch technique, he leads this surface casualty to safety. While this casualty removed from a dangerous location is carried to the safe area by means of the four-handed seat method, Members of the rescue group have been trained in the proper tagging of unconscious casualties. Then, upon the arrival of the organized rescue service, with its power equipment and advanced rescue techniques, the block rescue warden puts himself and members of his group at their disposal. A job well done, Bill Collins. First, thorough pre-attack training. Then, constant practice through many instruction sessions so that when disaster struck your neighborhood, you and the people of your block were ready, able to save the lives of many of your neighbors. Remember, disaster seldom gives advance notice. It may come in the dead of night or in broad daylight. It may strike your neighborhood today, tomorrow, next year, perhaps never. Nevertheless, it is your job 
as block rescue warden to have your rescue group ready. Thousands of lives were lost during World War II in the cities of England and the continent because of lack of sufficient trained neighborhood rescue groups. Training in neighborhood firefighting and basic rescue operations may be available at your state or local level. At the national level, FCDA technical schools have been established to train your city and zone level wardens who, after their own training, will pass on this instruction to you, the block rescue warden. Thorough pre-attack training, leadership in time of disaster, is your twofold responsibility. The people of your neighborhood depend on you. For the block rescue wardens are the keystone of the neighborhood's defense against disaster. Are you ready to measure up to the role of the warden in rescue?